We were wondering if some of the answers were right. Okay, was that the one I was Yeah, that's the one we were about last time. Oh, but I don't know. The only one I missed was one that said about least associated with blood samples. <coughs> I couldn't pick it up. I was hoping I'd be able to I was so I had many meltdowns while I was like doing it, and so it was, just, it was not going well. Okay, I'm gonna have it. Okay. I can't find the answer. I don't know what it is. I just made it go. Okay, I'm gonna go somewhere else. I couldn't, I was like, they all have blood in them. So, I don't know which one it is. Which one is it? It is. Stratified squamous was the right answer. I picked dermis. Mostly because I just gave up and picked an answer.
because <clears throat> connective tissue itself, connective tissue proper, you can pretty much say, wherever you go, you're going to find that. Uh, but when we get to cartilage and bone, really we have some very specific things anatomically to say about them. And so I want to emphasize where these cartilage uh, pieces are. Now, let's not forget, while we're doing this, that the consistency of the cartilage will continue to be defined by the proteins there. In other words, um, the, the resilience of the tissue, <coughs> the feel of the tissue, its compression abilities, etc., are still going to be due to the same things that we learned. The, the presence of, of, of gags and, and proteoglycans glycans and those bottle brush um, features, um, which is why uh, so many people say your cartilage entry, you need to be taking chondroitin um, for, your, for your joints. This is what they're thinking, the connective tissues and the cartilage. And what's more is the matrix, although it cannot be seen as well in highland cartilage, the matrix it itself also contains high quantities of collagen, as bone does. And so the collagen fiber types are a little bit different. To you, as I've mentioned, there are you know, more than a dozen different kinds of types. And so this is a very thin looking collagen. You can't really see it under the microscope. Um, but it's there. It is the reason for the consistency of the tissue. All right, so that's all I want to say about the look of them uh, in the matrix. What I really want to emphasize is the locations here. Notice that the first thing here tells you that the hyaluronic cartilage forms most of the embryonic skeleton. Okay, now this is going to return in your lives whenever I get to bone. So I want to say it now, <clears throat> and then I want to say it again. Bone in the human body is made um, in two primary ways. The first way bones that you're going to learn that bones are made is a process called endochondral ossification. And that is really the main process by which long bones are formed. And I'm going to teach you a stepwise outline of how bones are made by endochondral ossification. That process begins with hyaline cartilage models. So the long bones, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, the carpals, the phalanges, um, the metacarpals, the femur, the tibia, the fibula, the the tarsals, the metatarsals and phalanges. These bones, that we call long bones, the carpals <coughs> don't really look long, but they fit in this category, are made out of hyaline cartilage models. And so as we learn the process of endochondral ossification, we get to the end of it, you're going to find that the bones, a long bone, has cartilage on the end of it. <coughs> The cartilage that you find in joints, people think of as something separate from bone. But it's not separate from bone. It's true, there are other kinds of cartilage that we we'll find in joints that are not hyaline. But all the ends of long bones have this stuff on the end of them. And that won't surprise you once you've learned the process of endochondral ossification. It is the remnant of the embryonic form of this bone. It used to be hyaline cartilage. So that's a big statement. Most of the embryonic skeleton, the bones that are made by endochondral ossification start as this. You cut them early in development, this is what they look like, high on cartilage. And so you will learn those processes as we get to the bones. All right. So the second piece goes with that, covers the ends of the long bones and the joint cavities. Well, of course it does. Because when you're finished making bone, the end of the bone is still covered with cartilage. Now, we also find this stuff forming the costal cartilage, the ribs. And this is an unusual kind of joint. I'm going to give it a separate name for you when we do the joint, um, when we do joints later. And I define all these different synchondrosis and syndesmotic joints. We'll learn these. And you can see here that the ribs are connected to the sternum by way of costal cartilage. Now, go ahead and make note here. This is information that you can never forget. There are 12 pairs of ribs. The first seven of those ribs are connected directly, the 
first seven of them are connected directly by way of highland cartilage junctions to the sternum. We call them the true ribs. The last five ribs are called false ribs, but the first three of them still have connections. So you can see the last three ribs do in fact have connections to the, uh, to the sternum, but their connections are via the cartilage of the seventh rib. The last two have no hyaline cartilage on them. They're floating. So these are very important junctions. You already learned about the cartilage earlier in our discussion that it is a great example of a poorly vascularized connective tissue. It was the one that I used as the model to separate different um, vascularization paradigms. Dermis, very highly vascularized. Cartilage, very poorly vascularized um, tissue. And so when you're doing surgery in the thoracic cage, you don't cut the cartilage. All right, now, the last two are, uh, the last couple here are the cartilages, the nose, trachea, and larynx. So sure enough, it's highly cartilage on your nose. So nobody has trouble imagining that. But the trachea and the larynx will become important pieces of anatomy for us as we proceed through the semester. The trachea is part of the respiratory system. And it will be described to you as a reinforced garden hose. It has no other function other than to allow air to move from the lung and out. And so it never closes. There's no regulation. There's no physiology <coughs> in the trachea. The reinforcement of the trachea wall is hyaline cartilage. And there are 20 C-shaped hyaline rings that are angled posteriorly. The opening of the C is angled posteriorly, and that is an important anatomical observation because posterior to the trachea is, of course, the esophagus. And so the opening in the hyaline cartilage prevents the trachea from impinging on the lumen of the esophagus. So they're important for trachea. And in the larynx, there are, in fact, six named cartilages that make the structure of the larynx. And you will learn all of them, three paired and three unpaired. They're not all hyaline, but the bulk of the mass, that's why it's listed here, the bulk of the mass of the larynx is a piece of hyaline cartilage. You call it your Adam's apple, perhaps. It is known as thyroid cartilage, and it's the largest one and the easiest one to palpate, and it's this stuff. Hyaline cartilage. Okay, so where is hyaline cartilage? Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. It's the long bones. It's in the respiratory system. It's your nose. It's your trachea. It's your larynx. And so it's very important. All right, here's the second one. This is the last of cartilage, and most people can look at this and see the difference immediately. Now, how would you describe the difference in the anatomy just by looking in layman's terms? The difference in the anatomy of the histology section. Of elastic versus hyaline cartilage. Looks like it's a lot fuller. Okay, fuller. It's got fiber. It looks fibrous. Yes. <coughs> okay. What are those fibers? Elastin. Yeah. And what's elastin? The protein. Yeah. So once again, we return. Yes, to describe this. It. It is. It has got more rubber band-like quality to it with the elastin protein. Now, this is the stuff that you find supporting the peanut, which is the external ear, and it's also found in the epiglottis. Now, that is also, so the larynx, I just said, these are, remember, things that you can never forget. The larynx is made up of six named cartilages, three paired and three unpaired, and I taught you thyroid cartilage is the big one. Okay, this one is another cartilage of the larynx. And it sits on the superior, the anterior, superior edge of the voice box. The anterior, superior edge is the epiglottis. And it's elastic cartilage. So if you had to guess about the differences in the function of thyroid cartilage versus epiglottis, what would you think the difference would be? Exactly. And which one would that be? This one, right. This is the lid of your respiratory system. When you swallow, the epiglottis bends and closes the airway. If it does not, 
you will have a gag reflex to remove whatever gets into the larynx. You will cough that up. If you do not cough that up, whatever you have swallowed will end up in your lungs, and that's deadly. So is this important? Yeah. Elastic cartilage, the epiglottis, that sits on the superior anterior rim of the voice box. And you can see, because of its structure, what it's capable of doing. All right, here's the last one. This is fibrocartilage. Um, once again, you notice the major structural protein here is collagen. And fibrocartilage is a little bit tougher. The, the collagen's a little uh, denser in fibrocartilage, so it gives it some great tensile strength and the ability to absorb compressive shocks. And so you find this stuff in places that support weight normally. For example, the intervertebral disc of the vertebral column which is what this picture shows you. Now, you don't have any of those in the lab. This is living tissue. And uh, once you take the bone out, um, this stuff degenerates. And you don't see it on the skeleton unless they um, do like the one. There's a model in the lab you can look at. And it has some of these little soft pads between the bones. So this is soft tissue between each of the bones of the vertebral column. And it is. Um, intended to help us with compressive shock things. Now, this is also, because you, you guys could probably see this coming, this has also got major clinical ramifications. The presence of fibrocartilage pads between the bones really describes the first and most of back problems that people complain about in this old world. So, um, this is what we call um, a disc, an intervertebral disc, and clinically um, the pieces of this disc are referred to in ways that you probably should know. So I'm going to use the words, write them down, and you'll hear these words uh, referred to when we talk about cartilage. The rim, it's really pericondrium, it's, it is the, the capsule, it's the encasing of the cartilage, is technically known as the annulus fibrosis. And this is a very common term that osteopaths will use when they refer to a slipped disc. They will refer to the annulus. Now, this stuff is not liquid. It's more like a pulp-like material. And so the technical term for the stuff inside the annulus <coughs> is the nucleus pulposus. The nucleus pulposus or the pulp inside the annulus. And um, if you've ever seen an x-ray or an MRI of a back of an individual who has damage to one of these, you will see pieces of this disc that have protruded. Now, they don't normally just protrude and break off. The annulus is damaged and the pulp, the pulp of the disc is then pushed out in one direction or the other. And that is uh, a lot of times going to cause pain because of the sensory uh, fibers around the, the area. Now let's say, say two more clinical things and I'm going to leave it so I don't get bogged down here. Uh, the vertebral column, right? Information you can never forget. The vertebral column in a normal human being has curves. These curves are not medial lateral curves, rather they are anterior, posterior, or dorsal ventral curves. And so in your neck, there's a natural curve anteriorly, the anterior ventral curve of the cervical region. On the 12 bones of your vertebral column where your ribs attach, those bones curve posteriorly. They protrude posteriorly, so that's called a dorsal curve. Then as you reach the bottom into the lumbar areas of the vertebral column, you have another anterior curve. And that one is shown right here. That is, can you see the slight angle here forward? See that this bone is a little bit further this way than this one is? So there's a slight anterior curve here in the lumbar regions. There are five bones in the lumbar region, and they are angled forward anteriorly. And then the sacrum and cop extend form the last dorsal curve at the bottom. The reason I point this out here is because these pads 
have to withstand compression all of your life. In fact, they will shrink with age. A man in his 70s will be, or a woman in her 70s, will be shorter than she was in her 30s because of the compression of these pads. You will lose height as you get older. Now, in addition to that, the pads, these fibrocartilage pads, between L4 and L5, between L4 and L5, and between L5 and S1, hold literally the mass of the weight above the waist. The first sacral bone, this sacral bone right here, S1, is said to be the body's true center. Its borders are called the sacral promontory. You can see that on the anterior edge. So you've learned this in the lab already. The sacral promontory. I see a couple of nods. That will be on your lab exam next week. I will label the sacral promontory. I always did. And so this little piece of the S1, anterior piece of S1, that is the body's true center. It's a very important spot. And the weight of the body <clears throat> from there up presses on these two more than any other. And can you see the problem here? Because of the angle, there's a tendency to push those cartilage pads out, away from the bones. And so normally, slip disc or back injuries happen here. And it's, it's such an important location that as we get to it, as we're working our way through anatomy and we get there, I'm going to teach you all the little bells and whistles around here so you can see where all that pain is coming from. Now the primary, the primary pain generation here in the L4, L5, um, uh, S1 area is caused by the pulp protruding out of the annulus impinging on sensory neurons. <coughs> now again, information that you can never forget in anatomy it comes up over and over and over again. Coming off of your spinal cord on the dorsal side. Coming off on the dorsal side is a cluster of neurons, a little ball of neurons called the dorsal root ganglia. And there are no exceptions. I love places where there are no exceptions. There are no exceptions to this rule. Everything sensory goes through those balls of sensory neurons. We call them the dorsal root ganglia. And there is a pair, there are there is a pair of them at each level. And normally, when somebody says finally, I want surgery, it's because the pulp is pressing that ball of neurons those dorsal root ganglia neurons up against the transverse process of the lumbar bones. If they're being pressed up against the transverse process, you are stimulating them. And they are sending information to your brain. And your brain is going to interpret that as pain. That's right. You don't have pain in your legs, but man, the pain I feel in the back of my leg is overcoming. I can't walk. The damage is here, um, caused by the fibrocartilage pad, oftentimes, at L4, L5. So it's a really important spot in human anatomy. Okay, and the last one, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the disc of the knee joint. They're called the menisci <coughs> of the knee. And they're, uh, they are, in fact, um, also C-shaped pads. They are C-shaped pads that sit on top of the tibia. What is the surface, young bone learners, of the tibia call that the menisci, the fibrocartilage pads, sit on? Good. So the articulating surfaces. And um, have you managed in your world already to distinguish between what you mean by a condylar surface? And an epicondylar surface? Yeah. How would you distinguish? Epicondylar area outside. Great. So the menisci sit on the condylar surfaces. So what will be the name of the surfaces on the femur? The medial and lateral? Condyles. The, the lateral medial 
condyles that sit in the condylar surfaces, but they don't really do that. What do they sit on? They sit on the menisci, yes. Now, last thing here, we'll leave it. The fibrocartilage pads of the knee, these discs of the knee joint, are C-shaped, which means on the medial aspect, they are thin. On the anterior, lateral, and posterior aspect, they are thick. Why? What is the function of a meniscus? Cushion? For sure, cushion. Why are they C-shaped? Why? There's more pressure. Why are they not uniform all the way around? Like a rotation? Or you can rotate If it's to the, the circular curvature of the bone at the bottom, they keep getting hooked. Yes. This is a stabilizing feature of the knee joint. When do you damage when this? You tackle by a quarterback. Okay. <laughs> okay, right. When the condylar surfaces of the femur move off of the condylar surfaces of the tibia, the only way to do that is to press through fibrocartilage. It is it's cushioned, sure but it is cushioned in a stabilizing fashion. So the condylar surfaces are not allowed to move medial lateral, anterior, posterior, because the thickenings of the fibrocartilage prevents that. Now, are there other things in the knee that help prevent that? Yes, and we will learn those. But this is the first one, the menisci of the knees help to stabilize. So if you tore one of your collateral ligaments or one of your cruciate ligaments of your knee, it's likely that you also damaged the fibrocartilage. And it's a pretty easy test. When they do the ACL test, they just put you on a table, and they pull your knee forward, they pull your tibia forward, and if it comes forward, that is not a good sign. The ACL is gone, and you're likely to have also torn the misty in the process. Okay, bone. Um, so I have several things I want to say about bone here. We'll talk a little bit about bone development here. Um, and uh, we, we'll have to return to it as well. So, okay, so this is the section of bone, but this is not the way all bone looks. You should be aware of that. Yeah, I got to that picture. I mean, it there. So a bone, of course, supports and protects and provides livers, muscle attachments. It's uh, important for calcium storage. It's got marrow inside it, which we talked about. The online thing, blood cell formation happens here. Let's start by describing the anatomy of the histology, or the histo, describe the histology for the anatomy of bone. This is a section. This is a section of what we call compact bone. Now let me show you this next picture and I'll come back to this. This is a section of compact bone. Now this picture shows you, this is a, what bone is that, young people? That is a humerus. That is a humerus. That's right. Okay, so what kind of cartilage is this? This articular cartilage. Are y'all following this? That's why I told you. These are things you can never forget. That's hyaline. Where did it come from? It came from development. That's right. Because this long bone originally was all hyaline cartilage. And we converted it into bone in the process. Okay, now, the ends of the bones we call the epiphyses, and the shaft we call the diaphysis. Now, from the lecture that you listened to online, there is marrow present in the epiphyses, reticular connective tissue. Right? What kind of marrow is that? Red. Now we're reading it off the slide. <coughs> no, it's not on there. Yeah, so you can see that here. The shaft, the diaphysis of the bone, also has connective tissue in it, adipose tissue, yellow marrow. Okay, so reticular connective tissue that we identified as bone marrow in the slide, in the presentation that you watched online, is different from the marrow that you find in the shafts of long bones, right? Fat versus reticular. Okay, functionally, what's the difference between red and yellow. The red produces blood cells. Yeah, so red marrow is the blood cell 
red marrow is the hematopoietic tissue. This is where blood cells are being made in the ends of bones. Now, it should be noted here, and this again, we want to say this over and over, it should be noted, this is not the only place in the body where blood cells are made or where reticular connective tissue is found. Right? Like where else would you find reticular connective tissue? The spleen. The spleen. Anything else? The picture was the spleen, but what would you say? Lymph nodes, yeah. So, now we don't call that tissue hematopoietic tissue. We don't even call it red marrow, we call it lymphoid tissue. Okay, so this is an anatomy observation that carries enormous weight. There is red marrow hematopoietic tissue present in the ends of long bones for the purpose of blood cell manufacturing. You also find reticular connective tissue where blood cells are supported in many, many different types of tissue. We call those generally, we call those lymphoid tissues. So let's get a list right now of those two and we can just come back to it anytime during the semester we want. Ready? Okay, so hematopoietic tissues, red bone, red bone marrow reticular connective tissues where blood cells are being made. Okay, number one on the list, where in the bones? In the ends, in the proximal and distal epiphyses of long bones, red bone marrow. Okay, in addition, you will find the same stuff, this red marrow reticular connective tissue in flat bones. Can you name some? The scapula has red marrow in it. It's very thin, so there's not much there. Okay, there is some in the ischium, but that's not the biggest flat bone on the hip. The ilium spelled with an E or an I? I. Ilium spelled with an I. Where else? Why don't you start me at the top? Okay, can you give me some names? Wait, let's let somebody else help. Okay, give me some bone names. Frontal, parietal, occipital. Temporal. These all have red marrow in them. All of them. Skull bone, scapula, ilium. Another flat bone. Come forward in the thorax. Attach the costal cartilages. The sternum. Exactly. Flat bone with red marrow in it. Um, one more that you may not know. It's not really a flat bone. It's irregular. The centrums or bodies of the cubal bones all have red marrow in them. Okay, so where are blood cells being made? All over the place. Let's say that you have some suspicion or some kind of leukemia or some kind of um, developmental problem in blood cells. You need a sample of the reticular tissue. Specifically, you need a sample that shows the different stages and proportions of blood cells that are present there. This will help you diagnose what's going on. Right? Where are you going to go to get that? Okay, would you would you want to stick a large bore needle into the skull? That doesn't seem safe. What about the sternum? That doesn't seem safe. What's that? Yeah, so this is normally where they go. 